Hey everybody, this is Christian and in this video I want to show you how I'm managing storage in Kubernetes. Because if you're running a high available cluster where you need to maintain a reliable and robust storage for your persistent applications, you know this can be quite a painful and sometimes complicated topic to deal with. But don't worry, I was just recently searching for an easy solution and I found the free and open source distributed block storage provider Longhorn, which is absolutely outstanding and makes dealing with storage in Kubernetes so freaking easy that it's nearly unbelievable. It provides a CSI plugin to easily create and manage persistent volumes for all of your applications that are replicated across the entire cluster. You can manage everything in a nice and intuitive web UI and create automated snapshots and backups so you never have to be afraid of losing your data. It even allows you to store those backups on an external S3 or NFS server. For example, I'm storing all my volume backups in Unraid. And of course, I'd like to show you how you can easily do this and install it on your Kubernetes clusters as well, so let's check it out together. But before we do that, I've got something else very exciting for everyone who is running Kubernetes in production. Because as you might know, running Kubernetes on Azure, AWS or GCP can become quite expensive for a company, simply because most companies just don't have the visibility of what their teams are actually running in the cloud and if they're doing it efficiently enough. And that's where Cast AI, the sponsor of today's video, can help you out. This is a cost monitoring and management platform which reduces cloud costs of companies on average by over 50%, which is insane if you just think about it. And this is possible because Cast AI has one of the fastest auto scalers on the market, which continuously monitors your cluster and applies changes in real time based on the actual load to keep your configuration as efficient as possible without sacrificing performance. This allows your clusters to maintain a minimal footprint while greatly reducing their costs. By the way, Cast AI also supports some advanced features like the Evictor feature, which continuously consolidates pods onto fewer nodes, as well as GPUs, which is great for your AI or ML workloads, and you can even benefit from spot instances. What is also super cool about Cast AI, it lets you monitor your EKS, AKS and GKE clusters completely for free. So there is no limitation if you just want to know what's going on. And if you want to use their auto scaling and cost optimization feature, you can just upgrade based on the size of your infrastructure. They don't take any percentage of your cost savings. So don't waste money on Kubernetes cloud resources anymore. Use the link in the description box down below, sign up on Cast AI and connect your clusters today. All right, guys, so now let's get back to topic and talk about easy storage on Kubernetes using Longhorn. And first of all, I want to briefly explain why this application is so amazing and why we need such a thing in the first place. Because if you've watched some of my older videos about Kubernetes, you know that in the past I had always used NFS volumes and they also allowed me to store data for applications in persistent volumes across the entire Kubernetes cluster. Just outside of the cluster, in my case on a separate storage server where I was using redundant hard drives. And sure, NFS is great for that, especially if you're storing the data on a NAS that allows you to take snapshots of your disks and pools. So if you lose any data, you can easily just go on your NAS and roll it back without having to worry about the complexity of Kubernetes. So yeah, why not just continue doing this? Well, using NFS introduced some additional challenges in combination with my recent decision to switch my NAS operating system from TrueNAS scale to Unraid, because as you might know, Unraid doesn't support snapshots, so I couldn't easily roll back application data anymore. And I also wanted to have the possibility to store the data for my applications in Kubernetes inside the cluster itself, so that the cluster becomes an entirely independent environment that doesn't need any external device or server functionality, which would also be much faster for my new deployment since the Raspberry Pis I'm using to run my Kubernetes cluster on all have NVMe drives. And yeah, those were the two main reasons why I was searching for a better way to handle storage in Kubernetes. And this is exactly where a storage provider like Longhorn jumps in. Honestly, it was about time that I kicked myself on the butt and finally learned how to do it the right way. 
Now, of course, Longhorn isn't the only solution to deal with this problem. Yeah, I've also looked at other alternative solutions like OpenEBS or Rook Ceph on Kubernetes, but Longhorn definitely seems to be the simplest and most reliable option for me. Of course, simple is relative here because we're still talking about Kubernetes. Uh, by the way, if you're entirely new to this topic and you're wondering what the hell is this guy talking about, I can just recommend watching some of my older videos and tutorials about Kubernetes and those topics. Also, definitely take a look at the Longhorn's documentation pages. They are really great and explain a lot of the terminologies and provide you some valuable guidance on running Longhorn in a production environment, including hardware and software requirements, performance optimizations, disaster recovery steps and so on. So definitely check that out. But let's forget all this theoretical stuff for a second and let's get practical. I think that makes it just a bit easier to follow. This is my testing Kubernetes cluster I've installed on three virtual machines. By the way, I'm running the exact same setup on my production Raspberry Pi cluster as well. But I think this is where I can better demonstrate all this stuff. And I've already deployed a traffic reverse proxy and a cert manager for managing TLS certificates. So we can later very easily expose the Longhorn web UI. By the way, if you're new to this topic, there is a video about about traffic and cert manager coming out next week. So definitely stay tuned for this. You can follow me on Patreon and watch the video when it comes out. And to get Longhorn up and running on this Kubernetes cluster, we first need to follow the quick installation guide with some best practices and definitely take a close look at the installation requirements because Longhorn requires a couple of components running on your Linux operating system. And depending on what Linux distribution you're running, you might need to add a few of those components to your installation. Installation. Now, there's an easy way to check if your Kubernetes cluster is ready for Longhorn and all the requirements are working on your cluster. You can use this script here you'll find in the link and then just execute this on one of the nodes. So here, let's uh, open an SSH connection to the first one of my uh, Kubernetes testing servers and let's just run the script. Of course, I need to execute this with sudo permissions. And now it's doing some checks to see if all the dependencies are installed. You can see there are two errors and one warning that I got on my cluster. You can see a kernel module is not enabled on all of the free nodes, as well as the NFS common packages are not installed. Let's quickly solve those issues. By the way, if you're encountering any other problems, you can just follow this guide here. First of all, we need to install the NFS version 4 client. So this is the NFS commands package. And we also need to load the kernel module for iSCSI TCP. So I'm just opening a new connection to all of the nodes. And let's first check if we have installed the open iSCSI packages. So that is installed already, but as you can see, we don't have the kernel driver. So let me load this. And I also want to enable the daemon. Start this. So that should have the kernel module installed. You can check by just running an ls mod command and grab for the iSCSI package. And yep, kernel module is loaded correctly. So now we need to install the NFS common package. Now let's also do this. And I think there was one more warning here about the multipath D. This seems to be a known issue uh, in Longhorn. And there is actually a documentation for this with some troubleshooting steps that you can do to fix this. By the way, I've tested it and it didn't work for me on the latest Ubuntu LTS version for whatever reason, I don't know. Some of the researching about the GitHub issue that people reported also revealed that some just recommend to stop the multipath D application. So we can basically just do that. So just disable this daemon, stop it, and then this issue should also go away. Now, again, let's uh, try to run this script again and see if there is still a problem. Now, that seems to be okay. I've got no more warnings, so we can start installing Longhorn on my Kubernetes cluster. Of course, there are different ways of how you can install this. Yeah, if you go to this documentation, you can see you can install this using Rancher. If you're using that application to manage your cluster, you can use kubectl, you can use Fleet, Flux, or Argo CD. Of course, I'm preferring the Helm installation way. I think that is just the easiest way to get started. But yeah, anyway, prefer what installation uh, procedure you like the most. Now, first of all, to install it on the cluster, you need to add the repository to your Helm application, of course. Uh, yeah, nah, I need to do this on my work workstation and yeah so that's uh, fine i've already got this now let's update to the latest version of the helm chart that is always recommended to avoid running into any problems 
and then we can simply install it. I think this is fine for a simple and easy installation, but of course you can customize any of the settings using Helm values. And I'm just gonna show you something about the Longhorn UI. So by default, it starts two replicas of the web interface on your Kubernetes cluster. Basically just best practice for redundancy. However, um, I think this is not such a critical uh, web interface for me. So I'm just gonna reduce this to one replica. Then it might need a few seconds to restart if one of the node goes down. But honestly, this is not a big deal. So let's just go in this project directory and let's just uh, create a new Helm values file where I put this setting here for the Longhorn UI and set the replicas to one. Of course, you can add any other settings to customize all of this stuff in here. Just look at the reference documentations to see what are the settings and what are the default values and so on. That's pretty useful. And then we can use the command to install Longhorn on the cluster. Um, I want to install the latest version, of course. I make sure to install this in the Longhorn system namespace. I think this is pretty important and also reference the values file. All right, so let's install it. And this might take a few minutes until everything is up and running. There are many, many resources, pods, service objects and stuff that Longhorn needs to function properly. You can see it here. By the way, what you might have noticed is that in the default values of the Helm chart, the service type object of the Longhorn web UI is set to cluster IP. So it doesn't expose automatically using a load balancer and an external IP address. Instead, it is only accessible from inside the Kubernetes cluster on this internal IP address here. So as I said, I'm going to expose it using traffic and cert manager. And uh, first of all, I want to create a new certificate object. Again, I will explain this in more detail next week in my cert manager in traffic tutorial, but this basically will just issue a new trusted TLS certificate from Let's Encrypt for this DNS name longhorn.cubetest1.home.seelcrave.de. I'm also going to create an ingress route for traffic. This will route any incoming traffic coming to this DNS name and forward it to the service object longhorn front end on this internal IP address. So now, uh, let me apply those two other resources as well. And now we should be able to reach the Longhorn Web UI on the DNS name. And yeah, this is the Longhorn Web UI. Unfortunately, it doesn't have an included dark mode. So I'm just going to use a simple plugin that is called Dark Reader. So I really love this application because it can turn any website into a dark mode. Definitely install this on Chrome or Safari. This is amazing. And yeah, now we can enjoy the Longhorn UI in a much more readable and better experience. Okay guys, so let me walk you through some of the most important parts of Longhorn. Of course, I'm not going to show you all of the different options because Longhorn honestly can be quite complex. I'm just gonna focus on the parts that are important for most of you guys out there. And uh, let us first start with the dashboard, this, uh, which gives you a great overview of the entire system and uh, the health and the status. For example, you can see how many volumes you have deployed on the entire cluster, how many of them are healthy, degraded or faulty. You can see how much storage is left for the volumes to be scheduled. Uh, by default, Longhorn will split the available storage into two sections, the schedulable area. So this space is available for new volumes to be created. And there's also a reserved area, which is important to not exceed the maximum disk capacity of the nodes. And it also shows you how many nodes you have deployed on your Kubernetes cluster, how many of them are down or unschedulable because if they might have any problems. And below, you also got a list of all the events that are locked in the Kubernetes cluster of the Longhorn namespace. If we scroll up and click on that green circle here, or we go to the nodes menu, this takes us to the list of all the nodes in the Kubernetes cluster. And you can see on how many nodes you have deployed the Longhorn system. So how many of the nodes are schedulable for any new volumes and replicas to be created on. Usually if you're running Kubernetes using etcd, you will have a minimum of three nodes in the cluster, which is also the recommended minimum number of nodes. But if you might have more nodes in your cluster, you could also set them to scheduling, which means they are available for new replicas to be created on. Eviction requested means you can request the removal of all the replicas if you want to remove one node from your cluster and maybe create and install a new one. And now these conditions are also important to indicate if all the prerequisites and modules that we have installed are correctly configured and if all the important parts are running like the NFS client and so on. So if you see any error in here, make sure to go back to the uh, beginning of the tutorial and see if you need to run the script again and if you need to fix some of the prerequisites of the tutorial. As you might have noticed, those are virtual machines. Uh, therefore, I have created them with a relatively small virtual disk. But of course, if I 
would expand the disk, then also the available storage would increase. And here in the storage reserved section, you can uh, configure how much of the storage is reserved and how much is available for new replicas to be scheduled. You can also add new disks here. For example, if you attach a new physical NVMe or SSD to your server, you can just add the path where the disk is mounted. Give this a different tag so you can very specifically configure with those tags on which disks those volumes are created and managed and so on. Again, it's highly customizable, but usually you don't need to do this. By default, it will always try to use the primary internal disk of the physical node. All right, so let's also go into the volume section. And of course, I've not deployed any volume on this cluster, so there's no persistent volume stored here. But we can create a new persistent volume to just show you how this is working. So if we click on create volume and maybe just uh, create a new volume with test volume, yeah. Uh, I want to uh, reduce the size a bit because, again, I'm using uh, virtual uh, disks with relatively small numbers of uh, capacity. So we will try to uh, allocate 10 GB bytes on this cluster here uh, with the number of free replicas. So this is the default number of replicas and the default number can be configured in the settings or in the Helm values. You can of course reduce this to maybe two or even just one. But make sure if you create a new volume with just one replica, that means the data is only existing on one of the nodes. If that node goes down or you're losing the disk, you don't have any additional replicas to restore the data from. If you didn't take a backup, we will also talk about backup and stuff in a few minutes so don't worry we'll go through this in detail but I think the recommended uh, minimum number of replicas would be three so if you lose the disk for whatever reason you still have two replicas where you can get back the data from one thing that might be pretty important is the access vote, which is by default set to read write once. And it's quite interesting that Longhorn provides you the option to set this to read write many, which is usually not always the default, especially if you are using volumes or very basic storage disks and providers on cloud uh, infrastructure. So this is quite nice that you have the option to set it to read write many if you want to schedule additional ports that all have access to the same storage volume. Um, that's how you can uh, create a volume. You can also add additional settings if you like, but honestly, I think the default options are fine here. So let's click on OK. And as you can see, now the volume gets created. It is detached now because it is not attached to any workload or port that is running. Uh, but this would be now available to add into any deployment for creating a persistent storage. And then it would start the volume and replicate the data across the entire cluster. Now let's do a quick and simple demonstration on how you would use this in production because there are actually two different ways of creating and managing volumes in Kubernetes and for those of you who don't know them yet I think I should give you some technical context. Now, you can either create persistent volumes in Kubernetes manually, just like we did in the Longhorn web UI. However, when I want to deploy my applications in Kubernetes that require persistent volumes to store any data, I mostly don't create those volumes manually. Instead, I use the different way to provision storage, and that is by using so-called persistent volume claims, something like this here. And this object will instruct Longhorn by using the integrated storage class provider to just provision and manage a new volume for us. And that has a big advantage because the application or the administrator doesn't need to know how to exactly create and manage these persistent volumes. It is another layer of abstraction where you just tell the storage provider, hey, I want 500 megabytes of storage for my application. And then the provider takes care of creating this volume, scheduling it on the nodes, creating the replicas and all of this stuff entirely for you. So this makes it very easy to request storage for applications. And another cool thing is you can specify in the persistent volume claim definition, what is the storage class provider that you want to use? So from which provider you would like to request that space? If you don't define this, it will automatically pick the default storage class and provider, which by the way should be Longhorn if you have just installed Longhorn as the one and only storage provider in your cluster. And this is also really amazing if you deploy applications using Helm, because Helm charts, they often have some persistent volume claim definitions in their chart for requesting a specific amount of storage from Kubernetes, but they don't really need to know what storage provider the cluster is using and so on. So when you're using Longhorn on your cluster, this works fully automatic. Let me just show this. 
Let's, for example, just deploy a simple application in Kubernetes that needs a persistent uh, storage volume. Something like Portainer, for example. I mostly use this because it is so simple and easy to deploy. And yeah, I've used it uh, quite heavily in the past. These days, not so much. But it is a nice application to manage Kubernetes and Docker containers. So let's just use this as a quick example. Now here in the data persistence section of the installation guide in Portainer, you can see that by default, it is creating a persistent volume using the default storage class on our cluster. So that means when you install this application using Helm, it will automatically request storage for the application using the default storage class provider, in our case, Longhorn. And now before I want to deploy this application, again, I will create some custom values here. I don't want to go into the details yet, so let me just start with some basic options here. First of all, I want to set the service type to cluster IP and create a new ingress object. Again, I will explain this in my traffic and cert manager videos, so don't worry about it. And then I'm just going to install this on my Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going to install this in a new namespace called Portainer using the values that I've just defined in that file. And yeah, let's just hit enter. We didn't specify any volume or any storage yet. This should be done automatically for us. So if we go back to the Longhorn web UI and go to volumes, you should see a new volume that has been created. As you can see, there is a problem here. This was of course on purpose because I wanted to show you something. When you try to create volumes or request storage from the Longhorn provider that exceed the maximum disk size of your cluster, there's only 17.9 GB bytes available storage in the cluster. And that means the uh, test volume that I've created with 10 GB bytes plus the uh, default disk size of the persistent volume claim in Portana, also 10 GB byte would exceed that available storage. So that's why it's failing. Uh, Longhorn is a very clever system that knows before the disk would exceed the maximum storage capacity and then fails the creation of the volume. However, you can easily fix this if you just delete our volume that you've created manually because we don't need this anymore. And then let's just wait a few seconds or maybe a minute or two and see what happens. Now the Longhorn storage provider recognizes, oh, okay, there is some space left. I can now start and create this volume. And this is what's happening now. Now Portana is starting the container. It's attached the volume to the deployment. Now it shows that it's degraded. Let's quickly go in here before it automatically fixes it itself. Because as you can see, there are two replicas that are failed. Uh, no, it starts repairing them and starts replicating the data across the entire cluster. And then it will switch back from degraded to healthy. And now the application should be up and running. By the way, I didn't issue a trusted TLS certificates. That's why you see a warning here, but I don't really care. Now I can start configuring the applications. I'm just giving it a new password, attach the local UI and yeah, use this application. So far, so good. And if we go back to the volume, you can also see and inspect all of the details of it. You can also see the actual size of the data. And here in this menu, you can also take any snapshots and backups of this volume. So you simply just click on take snapshots and it will take a few seconds until there is a new item in that list of changes created with a unique identifier. So if you want to go back in time from the day before, you can find that snapshot in the list and then revert back to these changes. Let us also talk a bit about snapshots and backups. So at first it might be confusing why we have both snapshots and backups and you might wonder what the hell is the difference. So in simple terms a snapshot is a point in time copy of a volume's data. So it's like a photo that you take of your data at a specific moment and each new snapshot that you create only contains the history of changes to the volume data of before which is perfect to go back in time and draw back any changes. For example, if you made a stupid mistake deleting something in a config, then you can easily revert these things if you took a snapshot before you made the changes and roll back. However, snapshots aren't small. In fact, they can be hundreds of gigabytes, depending on how many changes the application made to the data. And if you want uh, to do a disaster recovery, for example, if you entirely deleted the application, the volume is gone and uh, you would like to redeploy the application with existing data, you might want to store this outside of the Longhorn cluster where you don't need all these history changes. And this is what backups are for. So backups are basically a flattened version of snapshots. It's like a copy of the photo 
but without the layers underneath. Because for a disaster recovery, you usually don't need all these changes. If you completely lost everything, then you don't need to go back to a specific point in time. You just want your latest version of the data back. And to configure these backups, you need to go to settings and go to the setting that is called backup target. So here you usually add a link to a backup store using NFS, CIFS or S3. So those three options are supported. By the way, you can just fill in the backup target uh, in here or what you can also do and I like this a bit more if you go into the helm values of Longhorn there is a setting called default settings backup target where you can add your storage location link so I will just copy the backup target link on my Unraid server so I'm just going to show you that for a second here for example in the Unraid shares I've created a new persistent volume backup a shared location which is accessible by all of the IP addresses on my local network so it's really just a test volume that I have created and this is what I'm going to use in the backup target link so this is the IP address of the Unraid NAS server and this is the mount point Point where the shared volume is located. All right, so because the Longhorn test servers are part of that local network, they should have access to this. So I'm just going to redeploy the Longhorn uh, Helm chart using the Longhorn values. So let's hit enter. This should automatically update all of the settings that I have changed. Now that we have enabled this external backup URL and there is a place where we can store those backups, we can go back to the volume, click on the snapshot that we have created and now create a backup from it. Once you do this, the item in the list will switch from blue to green, which means this snapshot that you have created has a valid backup. And if we go back to the backup menu, you also should see a new item in here. When you click on this, you can see all the incremental backups that you have taken. When we go back to the main menu here, you can also click on that backup item to create a disaster recovery volume. So if you entirely lost everything or just restore from the latest backup of that list, here. All right, so that all might seem pretty straightforward. Yeah, you can take snapshots, you can take backups and yeah, it's all fine, right? Well, one thing that I always remember from my time when I was working as an IT service technician where I needed to set up backup systems for enterprise companies and so on was a backup is not what you want. A company doesn't need a backup. What the company really wants instead is to be able to restore data in case of a disaster or to go back in time and revert changes, which means it's nice to have a backup, but that doesn't really mean anything unless you'll be able to restore the actual data from that backup. So always remember this. It will save you countless headaches when you want to manage these systems. Never just take a backup and assume, oh, it's all fine, right? Always test if you can restore data from that backup. And that is exactly what I also want to include in this video. Let's first talk about restore from a snapshot. So to go back in time and revert any changes, if you lost some data, deleted something or whatever. So let me just demonstrate uh, this with a simple change that we want to revert. For example, let's create a new user, test user with a password and make this an administrator. And we use this to log in. Now, if we created that user and we made some config changes, we might want to take a snapshot. So let's go back to Longhorn and let's take a new snapshot right after this user was created. And now if I go back into Portana and for example, I accidentally delete all the users that are existing and I can't log into the system anymore, I might want to revert to the snapshot where the user was still existing. So first what we need to do is we need to take that workload down. And what we can do is we can scale the deployment of the Portainer application and set the number of replicas to zero. Because if we just delete the port, the workload, the Kubernetes scheduler will always <laughs> start it up again. But when we scale the entire deployment down to zero replicas, then Kubernetes won't try to restart the container when we delete it. All right, so no, the application shouldn't be accessible anymore. And if we go to Longhorn, the state is detached now, but that is fine, yeah? We can start reattaching the volume when we click on attach and attach it to a specific host where we can mount the volume and make our changes again, maybe on server test free. What is important to be able to revert back to any snapshots in time, we need to click on maintenance. So to attach the volume in maintenance mode. And once it is attached, we can click on the volume and we can see 
see, oh, okay, well, we see all the snapshots again, so everything is fine. So if I remember correctly, that was the point in time where the test user was still existing. So I want to revert back to this state and click on revert. And this will take some time until the volume data is rolled back. Uh, before you start the application again, you need to detach the container because it's currently attached in maintenance mode. So let's click on detach. And once uh, the volume is detached, we can scale up the application again. And now if we go back, um, you should see the volume is healthy again. So the application should be up and running. Maybe you need to wait a couple of minutes until the health check is uh, finished successfully. There's our application. Let's try to log in with our test user again. And yeah, as you can see, now we can log in. We go to users. There is our test user. So let's assume uh, we lose the volume and the application entirely. First of all, we of course should take a backup to the external location once we have a working snapshot. So let's go back to the volume and let's take a new backup from that snapshot here. So let's click on backup. This should switch to green. And if we go to the external backup location, you can see the last backup was taken a few seconds ago. This backup should include the latest status of the application. All right, fine. And what we can do now is we can just delete this entire application. So if we uninstall Portainer entirely from that cluster, we lost everything. But if we go to the backup location, you can see, ah, oh, all right, yeah, we, we are safe. We got a backup from this volume so we can use it for a recovery. Now we can just go to the main uh, item here and just click on restore latest backup. Or you can select the specific point in time or the latest backup that you took where everything was still fine. The one with two minutes created actually was the one. So we can click on restore. And now we need to create a new volume where the data from the backup is copied to. We can use the previous name, which is pretty nice because we can still have the same name consistency here. And we want to create this volume with three numbers of replicas with read, write, one settings. And then you click on OK. There is our volume again. It's uh, attached to the workload. But what is pretty important now, if we would execute the Helm installation again, this would create a new persistent volume claim. And that persistent volume claim will request storage from the Longhorn provider, but it will provision a new volume. So it would not use the existing volume that we have deployed here on the cluster or that we've restored here on the cluster. So how do you exactly attach the new workload to an existing volume? But there is an easy solution. It should be somewhere in the Helm chart because when a Helm deployment or an application has some settings for persistency, you should be able to have some sort of setting persistence existing claim. So there you can set the name of an existing persistent volume claim. This setting is what we need to define in the Helm values of Portainer. So let's go back in here and let's add the setting existing claim. Now comes a part that also confused me a bit and you need to pay attention to this. We only restored the volume. We didn't restore the persistent volume claim. So it's really important to understand the difference between those two. What you also need to do is when you restore the volume here, when you click on create PVC, it will create a new persistent volume claim for that volume. You can also use the previous PVC name. So that's created in the same namespace with the same name and click on OK. So now once that is done, we can query the persistent volume claims again and you should see a new item in that list. And then we can refer to the name of the persistent volume claim in the Helm values of Portana, and then it will attach the new workload to the existing objects. So let's do this and let's redeploy the application. Install Portana with the values that we've changed and try to log in with our test user to see if the data was restored from the backup. And yep, here we go. Uh, we have everything. The test user is still existing. So that proves that we have restored from the correct backup. And yeah, so this is how you can restore data from a snapshot to go back in time, revert to a previous version of the data, or to completely restore the entire volume if you lost the application from an external backup location. I think this is a pretty secure way. However, there's one thing that is also important to cover, and that is, of course, recurring jobs, because it doesn't help you if you forget to create the backup, then you make a mistake and yeah, uh, 
you find out you haven't created a backup, yeah, that's always the worst. So what I definitely would recommend is to create a recurring job here for creating backups and creating snapshots. Ideally, in the documentation of Longhorn, it is meant to be a create a snapshot first and from the latest snapshot always create a new backup and then retain a specific number of those backups so that you have some options to go back in time. So maybe if you delete something, you probably don't find out immediately that something is wrong. You might find it out a day or two or three days later or maybe a week. Then you should have enough increments of your backups and snapshots as well to pick the right point in time to go back. And you can configure this by creating a recurring job for creating snapshots and taking backups. This is the number of snapshots to retain. So maybe you retain seven snapshots and in the cron job you can edit the specific time if you take this every day. By the way, this has a pretty nice cron generator so where you can pick a specific time or a specific day of the week, whatever you like. Um, you can configure or use any cron expression here. And then you have one week to go back in time. If you miss that, well, that's your problem, yeah? So you might increase the number of retains. But always remember, the more changes you make to the data, the bigger those snapshots can grow. And yeah, once you create a snapshot job, you should also create a backup job. But there you might retain just one or two of the latest backups because you don't need so many points to go back in time because remember a backup is only there for if you lost everything and yeah this is how i have configured it on my production setup to always make sure i have a working snapshot to go back in time and revert any mistakes or config changes that i've done wrong and a backup when i lost the entire application or cluster and i can always use that for disaster recovery of the application data Okay, everybody, so that's it about Longhorn and how to use it to securely manage a reliable and robust storage and a backup system for all of your applications in Kubernetes. Honestly, I'm really excited about it. And of course, I keep using it on my setup. I hope this video helped you to understand storage in Kubernetes a bit better and you could learn something useful. If you want to continue learning, then let me point you again to my Patreon page. It would be so kind if you consider supporting me there because that helps me to create more and more of these free tutorials for you guys. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day and I'm going to catch you in the next video. Take care. Bye bye.